breezy, bitterly cold overnight, although down to 8 degrees. Some sunshine tomorrow, but windy and very cold. New York City, Thursday, the 15th of January. It's a cold and clear day. I'm Craig Allen in the WCBS Weather Center. At the city's second airport, LaGuardia, an Airbus A320 is being prepped for a routine flight to Charlotte, North Carolina. One regular commuter on the New York Charlotte hop is business consultant Vicki Barnhart. She makes the four hour return plane trip every week, leaving her husband Mike to look after their children, Michael four and Samantha eight. I was excited and I was looking forward to getting back home. My daughter had been working hard all week to get all of her homework done so that she could spend time with me Thursday evening when I got home. Robert Cullerjay is a retired postal worker and proud grandfather from Massachusetts. He's heading south for a holiday with his 31-year-old son, Jeff. My dad's just a cool guy, you know. I just think of him as a friend. <laughs> Jeff is more of a best friend than a son because we've done everything as a family together all our lives. Star. It's really hard to explain. I mean, it's... A total bond. US Airways Flight 1549 gets clearance to board. But when father and son Rob and Jeff Cullerjay check in, there's a hitch. The flight is almost full. Rob is assigned a seat in row six, but Jeff has to sit separately near the back of the plane. Last minute flight, we couldn't sit together. And Jeff, my son, ended up in uh, seat 24. You know, we didn't even think anything about it one, one way or the other. On an ordinary day, a minor inconvenience, but today, it means they will face death alone. Vicki Barnhart is also unhappy with her seat in the jet's back row. I don't like sitting in the back, but the, the flight was packed. That was the only seat. I did try to actually move my seat closer to the front, but there wasn't, so I just stuck with it. Obviously, had no choice. Ground pack is uh... 1549, spot 28, taxi, please. At 3.24 p.m., the flight, call sign Cactus 1549, is cleared for takeoff. Cactus 1549 is a spot at 7134, and we're at runway 4, 360, and 5,000. Okay, 1549, we'll go to clearance. We'll be back to clearance. Verify information, Papa. We have Papa, thank you, catch yourself. The Airbus A320 takes off from LaGuardia's northeast runway. It weighs 66 tons and its two engines have a combined thrust of over 40,000 horsepower. There are 155 passengers and crew on board. The flight path will take them north, over New York City, before turning west to head for Charlotte. The flight is scheduled to take two hours. It will actually last less than six minutes. There was nothing going on on this flight to make me think that it was anything other than a flight I'd probably get on and probably sleep. Flying at over 250 miles per hour, the plane climbs over the densely populated Bronx. 54 seconds later, with engines still at takeoff thrust, 
the jet reaches 3,200 feet. Sales manager Mark Hood, traveling first class, is in seat 2A. It's a beautiful day, the sun's shining, it's crisp and cold outside. Out of the corner of my left eye, I glanced out the window and I saw what looked like a gray shape shoot by the window and hit the engine. But I knew immediately that the engine had been impacted because it sounded like a, a colossal bam. It startled everyone. What was that? What was going on? I leaned over and saw the flames, and at that point, I'm like, this isn't good. You know, this is not what you want to see. The captain immediately reports in to air traffic control. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539. Hit first through lost thrust on both engines, returning back towards LaGuardia. You turn left, heading up uh, 220. 220. With both engines out, the Airbus is dropping at 18 feet per second. At that rate, the Airbus will crash land in New York in less than three minutes' time. Terrain ahead. Pull up. He's got emergency returning. 1529, he, he uh, bird strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engine, so he's returning immediately. An Airbus A320 with 155 people on board is coming down over New York City after a massive bird strike took out both engines. The fate of the passengers and crew now rests entirely on the flying skills of Captain Chesley Sullenberger, nicknamed Sully. Married with two daughters, he is 58 years old, just seven years from retirement. He has flown for US Airways for nearly 30 years. The defining moment of his life and the lives of 154 other people is less than three minutes away. In the cabin, it's clear to some of the passengers that something is terribly wrong. The turbines weren't really moving as quickly as what you would normally expect, and it was there was an eerie silence except for a uh, knocking sound. Um, it, it's like um, tennis shoes rolling around in a dryer. That was a bird strike. Now the power is beginning to roll back, indicating that we do have a loss of power on both engines. Former Airbus pilot Jay Joseph is flying a flight simulator, which is an exact copy of the Airbus A320 cockpit interior. It is programmed to simulate a jet's second-by-second -second response to a double-engine failure at 3,200 feet. Every flashing light and instrument display is what the pilots would have seen and heard when disaster struck Flight 1549. Now the co-pilot is executing the dual engine failure checklist at this time, attempting to get a relight on uh, perhaps one or both engines. Okay, he's continuing with the quick engine start uh, checklist at this point. While Captain Sullenberger flies the plane, the co-pilot works through the procedure in the Airbus manual in a bid to restart at least one engine. The point that the aircraft lost thrust on both engines, it was essentially a glider, uh, a 140,000 pound glider. Air traffic control clears a runway for flight 1549 at LaGuardia, seven miles away. Hi, Cactus 1549. It's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Not able. Cactus 1549, runway 4 is available if you want to make left traffic to runway 4. Eddie, I'm not sure we're making any runway. Um, what's over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Ahead of him is Teterboro in New Jersey, but even that is six miles away. He might make it, 
But if he fails, it spells catastrophe, not just for those on board, but also people on the ground. As a professional pilot, Captain Sullenberger is trained to be calm in any situation. But in a later interview, his inner turmoil becomes apparent. It was the worst, sickening, pit of your stomach falling through the floor feeling I've ever felt in my life. The uh, physiological reaction I had to this was strong, and I had to uh, force myself to use my training and, and, um, and force calm on the situation. Flight 1549 will hit the ground in less than two minutes. Captain Sullenberger decides. LaGuardia is too far. Teterboro is too far. As he looks ahead, he can see one final option. Captain 1529, turn right 280. You can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. As this radar image shows, other passenger airliners are in the area. Eagle Flight 4718 is listening in and responds. Oh, I think he said he was going to the Hudson. In an interview later, Captain Sullenberger describes his decision with extraordinary calmness. The only viable alternative, the only level smooth place sufficiently large to land an airliner was the river. This has a potential to be catastrophic. To set himself up for a unplanned water landing is unprecedented. Nobody would have been thinking about that. Forced landings on water usually end in disaster. In 1996, an Ethiopian Airlines Boeing 767 cartwheeled on landing after ditching in the Indian Ocean at the end of a bungled hijack attempt. 125 of the 175 people on board died. In New York, people are becoming aware of the jet's rapid descent. Yeah, I'm witnessing the airplane is going down. It's on fire. Where? Where? I'm in the Bronx. Oh my God. Was it a large or small plane or what? A big jet. And I'm telling you, it's just plane legit. Yeah, it's a plane. Yeah, it's a The captain has had no time to tell the passengers what he is attempting, but they know they are going down. I remember the gentleman sitting in 1A grabbing, grabbing my arm and saying, we're going to die, aren't we? We're going to die. I'm thinking to myself, this cannot be happening. This cannot be real. This, you know, it, it was like a bad dream. Ditching in the Hudson is flight 1549's last chance. But standing in the way is a 600-foot high obstacle. I believe Captain Solberger had a number of significant obstacles, not the least of which was the George Washington Bridge. He had no options. That's what he had to work with. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Real-time radar mapping shows the jet approaching the bridge's eastern end at a height of 1,500 feet. Pull up. Ahead. 
He clears it with just a few hundred feet to spare. The George Washington Bridge was not something that uh, he had planned for on that approach, I can assure you of that. Emergency electrical power manual on. Whether or not he factored in the bridge, Captain Sullenberger navigates around it with extraordinary skill and makes a turn to line up over the Hudson. Below 500 feet, air traffic control may lose contact with the plane, but they need to know where it will come down. They divert a helicopter, which was taking tourists on a sightseeing tour to track the jet's movements. Okay, listen, um, we're gonna tell you something important. It's Cactus 1549. We see somebody low level in the Hudson River. The young lady sitting next to me said, we're gonna crash, aren't we? I said, yeah, I think we're going to. I remember looking at the skyline of New York City and just, you know, looking at it and I knew we were below the buildings. Man, we could hit a, a building. I don't want to hit a building because it's going to be like 9-11 again. Chitango Alpha, it looks like there's uh, maybe an incident here. Ahead. Oh, ah. The range ahead. Oh, ah. We've got a target on him, but he looks like he's low level. Okay. Okay? All right. Five hundred feet from impact, Captain Sullenberger makes the announcement no air passenger wants to hear. The pilot came on and he said, this is the captain speaking, brace for impact. I and a lot of others thought, this is it. It was eerie that the flight attendants in unison kept saying, brace, brace, brace. And then it was a silence for a second. And then they said, brace, brace, brace. And it was very eerie. It was one of those moments that was out of a, an Alfred Hitchcock movie. You know, we're crashing. Uh, you know, what are you gonna do? I, you know, I'm, I kept thinking, okay, you know, do I pray or do I send my wife a message? Do I call her? What do I do? So I quickly typed out a text. I said, you know, plane's on fire and I love you and the girls. And I hit send. And um, I remember looking at the phone and seeing the indicator light that the message got out. And I just kind of felt a sense of relief at that point that, you know, I got a chance to say goodbye. Life goes by instantly. It's like, will I see this person? Will I ever talk to this person again? If this was the end, was I, was I the person that I really wanted to be all my life? I was not ready to die yet. I have too many things to do. The possibility of not surviving was not a thought in my mind. Um, but neither was the thought of living. It was just a peace that was over me and I was ready to accept whatever was gonna happen. Two tangle off, is he still flying? Still flying. I reached over and, and held the hand of the lady next to me and prepared to be a dead man. Going down. Two tangle off, Roger. At 3.30 p.m., music industry executive Neil Lasher is in his 27th floor home overlooking the Hudson. I'm looking out my window and I see a, uh, a passenger jet coming right past the window and it wasn't heading up and it wasn't heading straight, it was heading down. Oh my God, something's going on here. It was unbelievable.
I had no idea when the impact was going to come or how much time I would have. I didn't expect there to be anything after. It was just this tense waiting. When are we going to hit? But it was just a jerking motion, and uh, and then it was just slowing down, and the plane actually groaned. You know, it was whoa. In the water. Roger. I thought it was going to break apart. I thought it was going to blow up. I had no idea. Calls to 911 pour in from all over the city. Now I'm going to take a look to my emergency. Um, a plane just passed into the Hudson River. OK, just passed. It went into the Hudson River? Yeah, a plane, an airplane just crashed into the Hudson River. I'm afraid to watch me to emergency. A plane has just crashed into the, into the Hudson River. Oh, my gosh. I was giddy with excitement. We're not dying today. What nobody knows is that the impact caused a breach near the plane's tail. And that's not all. The Airbus is equipped with a system that seals all the aircraft's vents and outlets to stop it taking on water after ditching. The procedure calls for one of the pilots to press the ditch button above their head. But on flight 1549, nobody pressed it. There simply wasn't enough time to depress the uh, ditch button. The fact that they got as much done with the amount of time available is, is unbelievable. When the engines failed, the co-pilot worked through a three-page technical checklist in a desperate bid to restart them. It's the right procedure, but it's designed for a descent from 35,000 feet, not 3,000. The ditch button is at the very end of this particular checklist. They simply didn't have time to get to it. Now, with power to the controls lost, the switch will no longer work. This and the impact damage mean that water is flooding into the plane. The captain of flight 1549 has saved his plane with an incredible feat of flying. But in the heart of New York City, the passengers and crew must now cheat death for a second time. As the water is coming in so quickly, I'm starting to think, I may be drowning. This may be, you know, we've survived the crash, but now we're going to drown. That is going down. Roger. Water. Roger. Having survived a forced landing in the Hudson River in New York City, the passengers and crew on board Flight 1549 remain in deadly peril. Thousands of gallons of water are flooding into the plane. No one knows it yet, but in just 24 minutes, the cabin and wings will be fully submerged. Anyone still on board will drown in the icy waters of the Hudson. Get me a police department helicopter if you got one on your frequency. Very good. Get me a police department helicopter if you got one on your frequency right now. We don't have one now, but we'll, we'll make a call. You get anybody, you send them right over to the Lincoln Tunnel. We had a cactus airbus go down in the water. He's actually went down? He went down in the Hudson River, being the intrepid there. Okay. He's sending out the rescue. Everybody's been notified, and just be careful with your arrivals, okay? Okay, good. Mike Whiskey. Within a minute of ditching, news of the incident is relayed to the crews of the Hudson's commuter ferry services. We got a call over the radio, plane in the water. So immediately I, I grabbed the radio, I said, we're on it. Uh, do you have that cactus in sight? No, the cactus is gone. He's down in the river right now. Vincent Lombardi's boat, the Thomas Jefferson, is the nearest to the sinking airliner. He immediately heads towards it, but it will take him nearly four minutes to get there, and for some passengers, that might be too late. 
I looked over to the left at the window and all I could see was water. So I actually thought we were underwater. First class traveler Barry Leonard is in seat 1C. The flight attendant said, take off your seat belt and, and go to the nearest exit. Well, for me, that was two steps, one forward, one to the left, I'm at the door. And I actually looked down in my seat to see if my body was there. <laughs> Laurie Leitner is one of the first passengers to reach the exits over the wings. I was at the door, I saw the water in front of me. CCTV footage shows the first passengers spill out onto the wings. But Laurie thinks the plane is about to sink. People behind me saying, we have to get out of the plane, get out of the plane, get out of the plane. So I jumped in the water. The water is only two degrees above freezing, and Laurie has no life jacket. All I could think of from the moment I jumped in was I have to get out of the water. At the front, Barry Leonard faces a dilemma. The escape chute, which doubles as a life raft, fails to open. And all of a sudden she said, jump, jump, jump. I looked at the water and then I jumped out, it's just straight out. Unfortunately, I didn't have a life vest. I didn't have a seat cushion, I had nothing. I've never experienced anything as cold as that in my life. I knew from reading that I probably had five minutes before I started to lose my faculties. At the back of the plane, the situation is critical. Water is flooding the rear, causing it to sink. And both exit doors are submerged, so can't be opened. Vicki Barnhart is in the back row. As the water is coming in so quickly, I'm starting to think, this may be how I'm dying now. I'm going to drown. It just felt like it was getting deeper and deeper. Um, and I remember just thinking, I have to tell my family goodbye. I flipped open my phone. I knew it would just take two pushes of a button to call my husband. Um, and that's what I did. Um, of course, I got his voicemail. I got a phone call from her. I just assumed that they were on the ramp and that she was going to be delayed. I just basically said, I think this is it. My plane has crashed. I love you. I love the kids. And I love you, I love you, I love you. I think that's basically what I said. But about 15 minutes later, I uh, checked her voicemail, and that's when you know, she basically said, you know, we crashed. She was screaming into the phone. Everybody around her was screaming. I felt somewhat peaceful. But I was also sad sad that I might be leaving a family so young. You know, your, your heart's ripped out of your chest. And I literally was shaking as I was looking at that phone. The flight attendant starts yelling to go to the wing, go to the wing. And so myself and a lot of other people turn around and start heading back up the aisle. The next thing I remember after that was stepping out onto the wing. Rob Cullerjay, who had been going on a golfing holiday with his son, leaves his seat in row six to join the crowd at the wing exits. People were actually climbing over seats to get out. Once we stepped out of the plane, the water didn't, it wasn't the thing that shocked me the most. It was the, uh, the slipperiness of the wing because of the jet fuel that was in the water already. Once on the wing, Rob's relief is short-lived. His son, Jeff, had been seated separately right at the back of the plane. And he can see that's now underwater. My son, I knew, was in the back. That's all I knew. I didn't know if he had gotten out yet. Now, is he in the back of the plane? stuck or injured. 13 miles away in Brooklyn, the NYPD scuba team is scrambled. Patrol bell goes off. We know we got to start getting ready, making our way towards the helicopter and getting going to the job. At the plane, several people have fallen off the wing or jumped into the water. 
and you could see the, uh, the fear and terror in her face. And I said, Miss, don't give up. I actually slid down into the water off the wing and grabbed her and pulled her onto the wing, yelling all the time, <laughs> you know, you're going to make it, you're going to make it. Nick Gamache is one of the last to reach the plane's forward exits, where Captain Sullenberger is ushering people into the rafts. He was just kind of standing there, and he was, he was the picture of calm. I mean, we just crashed a plane, and here he is, and he's wearing his, he's wearing his captain's jacket. And he was, you know, just telling people, get, get into the rafts, get into the rafts. And he was yelling at people for the back to come up to the front. After jumping out of the plane without a life jacket, Barry Leonard tries to swim to the shore, but then has doubts. There's no way that I could make it to either shores. I will not survive. I honestly just turned around and started swimming back to the plane. The front life raft on Barry's side of the plane has finally deployed. Freezing and in a state of shock, Barry is pulled onto it. There was a pilot that was sitting on the side of the raft, and he said, sir, you have to get out of your clothes. You're going to freeze to death. He actually took his shirt off of his back and gave it to me. Well, I thought it was just incredible that he had given me his shirt. Three minutes and 40 seconds after impact, the first ferry arrives at the scene. As I pulled up to the plane, guys were cheering, Women were crying. My guys started handing out life jackets. We tried to get as much out there in the water as possible in case somebody slipped off a wing or, or uh, one of the rafts deflated. You know, people's lives were dependent on us. Deckhands help Vincent carefully maneuver his ferry as close as possible to one of the wings. They were giving me hand signals. You know, three feet, two feet, stop. But the plane is in the middle of the river, where the current is fastest, making it a constantly moving target. So it's an ebb tide, and we're just on the south side of the plane, and the plane keeps turning in to my starboard side. As a second ferry arrives, another problem emerges. The boats aren't designed as rescue vessels. Their decks are nearly seven foot above the water, too high for the passengers to reach. The boat crews throw down nets and rope ladders. As passengers begin to scramble up from the wings, a new danger looms at the front of the plane. The back of his boat was starting to swing towards the people in the lifeboat. And we all start yelling at him to stop, 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 because he literally squished into the lifeboat and was making it kind of push up a little bit. And I thought, oh my gosh, you cannot injure those people. Ferry makes a lunge at us, not not on purpose, obviously. So we were yelling at him, saying, you know, stop, stop. The emergency slides, which double up as life rafts, are still tied to the plane. We wanted to cut the raft loose from the plane, so if the plane went down, it wouldn't pull the raft under, too. We immediately said, throw us a knife. Mark Hood is in the same life raft. The ferry came back tossed the captain a knife. The captain cut us loose, and we began to float free. 60-year-old Rob Cullerjay has been on the wing for over four minutes. His only hope is to climb up onto the ferry. I scooted up this makeshift ladder. At that moment, I was petrified because of the fact that I didn't see my son. I saw everyone else but except my son. Uh, one of the officers said to me, there may still be bodies in there. We don't know. Hundreds of New Yorkers are witnessing firsthand another major catastrophe in their city, and some of them are filming it. Oh, shit. That's Definitely a plan. The the yeah, the There's a life raft with people in it. In this previously unseen footage, workers in a Manhattan office block capture the dramatic scenes. But it didn't go under. It's, it's still above yeah. the water. It's still, I, see, I see the cockpit. 
Don't this stop is... recording, then you can sell that to the news people. When the NYPD scuba team arrive, they find a scene of chaos. Seven boats, including a US Coast Guard vessel, are pulling people off the rafts and wings. But there are also people struggling to stay afloat in the freezing water. A passenger captures the helicopter's arrival on his mobile phone. I remember climbing up the ladder as, uh, as the helicopter showed up and it was kicking up spray and dust. And I just remember thinking, you know, here I am climbing up this ladder and the wind shear from this helicopter is going <laughs> to drop me into the river. When we got down lower to the water, we saw that one victim in the water. And I said, that's, that's who needs the immediate help. That's the person that we have to get to first. And I knew that I can get to her much faster if I didn't have a tank on. Mike just gestured to me, he goes like this. He made the split second decision to take off his gear and uh, we collaborated and decided one with, one without. In the crush around the sinking plane, the helicopter can't get lower than 20 feet. Ordinarily too high for the scuba divers to jump. There's a lot of things going through your head, but the one priority is getting in that water as fast as I can and getting to that victim. Detective Delaney knows that if he delays, the woman could drown. He makes an instant decision. Detective Delaney went in first and he, he took off. Detective Rodriguez follows his teammate into the water. We swam up to her from, uh, from the side or the back and she was in a bit of a panic. She was, she was frightened. I told her to let go of the net. You're gonna have to trust me. And she then thought that the ferry boat was gonna roll over us or, or you know, run us over. We both swim her over to the closest platform, which is um, a rescue ladder with a platform that one of the ferry boats deployed. Now she's taken care of. And now, you know, the mode turned towards the plane. We got to get to the plane. We're, we're at this point, we're thinking there's, there's definitely victims inside. As the divers continue their search, Rob Cullajay is safely on a ferry. But he has been separated from his son, Jeff, ever since boarding the plane. I still hadn't seen my son yet. Your mind plays funny games with you. And I start seeing my son as a little toddler again. Things go through your, through your mind that I'll never see him again. Life ended too early for this kid. The plane is now just 13 minutes away from sinking. The rescue effort to save the passengers of Flight 1549 has been underway for 12 minutes. The rescuers don't know it, but they've only got another 13 minutes to get everyone out of the water before the plane starts to slip below the surface. And there may still be victims inside. I entered the plane from the wings emergency exit windows and I made my way very slowly. I finally make it to the center aisle after moving away some luggage. And at that point, I hear my partner screaming, get out of the aircraft. I told him to wait a minute. I took a good clean look, ducked my head under water a bit, felt around, didn't feel anything. And I hear him screaming again. And he says, get out, get out. And he makes a motion like that. And I didn't argue with him. I get out of the aircraft. He saw a shift in the airplane, and he, he saw uh, the water line going above some of the headrest in the aft part of the aircraft. So that, that was, uh, it was a good call. 3.55 p.m., 25 minutes after crash landing on the Hudson, half the plane's cabin is now submerged. Carlisle Lucas, captain of the ferry Athena, pulls alongside the life raft, carrying Captain Sullenberger. The pilot, he was the last man out, and uh, he came up and sat down in the upstairs cabin here on the boat. 
And then I asked him, you know, do you think everyone got out of the airplane? He said, I went down the aisle twice and looked in every seat. He goes, everyone's off that airplane. Shocked passengers are ferried to the harbour side. Rob Cullerjay is among them. I'll always remember one policeman coming over to me and uh, ask me what, you know, how are you? What, what, you know, why are you crying? I said, I don't know if my son's alive. More and more police officers were coming up to me and asking me, uh, what did he look like? What did he have on? As police search for his son, Jeff, Rob is recuperating at a temporary aid station on the New Jersey side of the river. It's almost four hours since Rob last saw his son. He is beginning to lose hope when suddenly there is a phone call. As Rob awaited rescue on the left wing, Jeff made it into a life raft on the other side. We're alive. I, I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it because, I, you know, I had just nightmares of, like, twisted metal and going underneath the water and just everything. Father and son are finally reunited. We just shared a big hug, and it was just really a cool feeling. Very emotional. He's saying, Dad, please, don't cry, don't cry. Didn't want to let go and uh, just told each other we loved each other and uh, just couldn't believe that what just happened happened. The, the odds of surviving something like that were a bazillion to one. An investigation into the crash is underway and has confirmed that the impact caused a breach in the plane's rear bulkhead. What is not in question is the scale of Captain Chesley Sullenberger's achievement. The outcome of Flight 1549 could have been very different. There are so many things that could have gone wrong that went perfectly right in this specific instance. Flight 1549's double bird strike occurred at 3,200 feet. Most bird strikes occur at under 500 feet. A sudden power loss in both engines at that height would have given Flight 1549's pilots less than 30 seconds to react, resulting in almost certain disaster. This is simply one of those circumstances where you don't want to run out of altitude, airspeed, and ideas simultaneously. Captain Sullenberger knew that he had to bring the aircraft down tail first at an angle of 11 degrees. Any steeper and the fuselage would have hit the water too hard, causing the plane to break up with fatal consequences. But speed was also critical. There was very, very little margin for error. If he would have run out of airspeed at 100 feet, it could have been catastrophic. Captain Sullenberger must touch down at no less than 130 knots or risk a fatal stall. If his airspeed falls too low, the only way to increase it is to drop the nose. But that would risk the engines hitting the water first, causing violent deceleration that could tear the aircraft apart. The passengers who survived Flight 1549 are already finding that the crash has changed their lives in unexpected ways. I know there's other things I'm supposed to do with my life, and, uh, and I think there's 154 other people that also have something that they're supposed to do with their life. <laughs>